by Dr. Paul N. Vincent, preacher, teacher, and prolific author of the popular Persistence Works book series, broadcasting the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ from El Paso, Texas to the world and bringing you into God's presence. Experience the difference. You'll never be the same. Don't just watch TV. Watch Persistence Works Television Network, PWTN. Hello, everybody. God bless you. Hey, this is another day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I want to welcome you to today's edition of Global Politics. We are focusing on Switzerland today. So welcome to this broadcast. We are going to have a great time. So I want to invite you to join me and invite somebody else to join. And please help me share this video. Um, we are streaming on 20 different platforms. We are streaming on our Persistent Works TV network, which reaches or streams on Roku, on Fire TV, on Apple TV. Those three alone reach combined 200 million potential on, um, viewers. And we are also streaming on our um, Persistent Works um, app, the Android and iPhone app, the two. We have combined 15,000 downloads. And this year we are trusting God. We are working on having 100,000 downloads and we will get there by the grace of God. We are also streaming on our website, persistenceworks.tv, and also on all the leading social media platforms, YouTube, our two Facebook pages, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, everything in between. So wherever you're watching us from on the 20 different platforms we are streaming, you are welcome. And also we are streaming and reaching across the globe. So if you are watching us from across the US, if you are watching us from across Europe, if you are watching us in Switzerland, we are talking about Switzerland today. So you better join us if you are watching from Switzerland. Also, if you are watching us from Africa, Nigeria, Egypt, Morocco, we are ever in Africa, South Africa. If you are watching us from Asia, Australia, Malaysia, um, India, Pakistan, wherever you're watching from, I welcome you today. And we are going to have a great time. Listen, in case you don't know, I'm your host as always, Bishop Connor Paul Vincent. So the Global Politics Program is a program we put together here on our Persistent Works TV network, where we focus on nations, cities, or states at a time. We zoom in on them and we talk about them. We explore their strengths and weaknesses, the leadership, what how they are doing, their economy. And we also kind of like use it to challenge and inspire other leaders, especially if there are countries that are doing well, we use it to inspire or challenge other leaders to follow suit, to follow their examples, to learn a few things from them. And I'm looking forward to doing as many nations, as many cities as possible. Also, we do get to talk with government officials and politicians in those countries. We are more especially in countries and places that have um, positive results of leadership. So, if if there's a country or city that's or a leadership or a politician that is a failed leader i don't think we're interested in doing a story on them well we may but to tell the story but i love to do um stories about places we can look to and we can challenge and inspire other nations to look to um as an inspiration as an example so we've done a couple of them and one of the interesting ones we did recently was rwanda which is a story of by itself because they had um, genocide about 30 years ago, over a million were killed and in 100 days, but today is a different story. One of the best um, tourism destinations in Africa. Well, we are not getting, going there today again. So let's focus on Switzerland. Um, I, I, by the grace of God, I was um, in Switzerland either in 2019, there about just before the pandemic. And my takeaway from Switzerland, uh, there were parts of Switzerland I visited, and my first impression, I was like, wow, how beautiful heaven must be. By the way, in case I've not introduced myself, I'm your host as always, Bishop Connor Paul Vincent. Now, I said to myself, how beautiful heaven must be. Why? Because I'm seeing such beauty, and I'm seeing nature at its best. It's as if God finished creating the world, and then put a, finish, a different finishing touch to Switzerland. And I'm seeing all of that, I'm, I'm, I'm like, wow, this is beautiful. I've been to many nations, many countries. I've lost count, maybe about 50 or there about, plus minus. But you see, uh, including the US, beautiful US, I've been to many cities in the US, but listen, um, it's nothing compared to my, my experience and view of Switzerland. So I love the country as a country. Of course, I may not, <laughs> I may not subscribe to everything they stand for, but there are basic things that have made them to become what they are. So we are going to be talking about 
how they've come to be what they are today. And one of the big lessons or takeaway that I want world leaders, especially in developing countries, that I want them to take away is that Switzerland is a combination of five different, five also different nations, so to speak. They have Germans, they have Italians, they have French, they have Dutch. Now, all of these coexist, of course, in their history, and we're going to get into all of this in detail. In their history, of course, they, they did have times when they fought war, both, both internally, internally within themselves, and also when they fought war with other nations. You see, there were nations that um, fought them, like um, the Great Roman Empire and um, France. They fought war with those. But you see, they were also in, in battle with themselves. But the most interesting thing is that they've learned to come to live with each other, to work together as a nation, despite their diversity. And one other interesting thing I saw, that I think African nations, especially those with very diverse um, population, like Nigeria, for instance. One thing I think they should take away and learn from is, even though it's a nation, I mean, Switzerland, even though it's a nation by itself, it's as if they have nations within the nation because um, what we call states here, they call it canton. Now, they have 26 cantons in Switzerland. Each of those cantons are just like countries of their own. Why? Because they have their own constitution, they have their own police, they have their own everything. So it's as if, what works for one for one part of the country may be very different and may not work for the other so you do what works best for you from your constitution to your system of government to your um you know your police and everything even though they have the central government so i think most of the african nations that have so diverse like tribes and different nations that make up the nation a good instance nigeria i think that's one of the best um forms of government they should adopt whereby all the different nations that make up the different entity that often make the infighting to be and the backwardness of the country to be so pronounced every nation every of those states or regions can be by themselves be their own nation as it were even though there will still be the central um, um nation central government but then each region controls its own affairs has its own constitution its own government and all of that um, if it works, if it has worked for them in Switzerland, I believe it can work elsewhere. But the bottom line is that to find, uh, it's important for leaders, politicians, I don't just like to use the word politician, leaders. And I know it's not every leader is a politician. Not every politician is a leader. That is one of the things we want to accomplish in this program, to challenge politicians to be leaders. Because it takes a leader to lead a country from from where you are, from the backward, from the last position to the first. It takes leadership. Everything rises and falls on leadership. But where leadership is um, missing, then you will have cases of, you know, anything goes. You have cases of 20, 30 years later, after independence or after uh, one democracy or the other, nothing to write home about. Things keep going from bad to worse. That is the case in many developing nations especially in africa which is why when i do broadcasts like this i challenge them i challenge the leaders the politicians to wake up and to learn from these other nations that have success stories you may not copy everything everything that works in a country may not work in yours but there are things you can learn and glean from and apply or adapt to your country what works best so um, we are going to get into, uh, we've put together some video, as we always do, you know, um, about Switzerland, both their history and their politics and all that. But you see, one of the, two of the key things that I saw that has helped them over the years, industry and banking. And that is to say, they don't have as, as much natural resources, they don't have natural resources like most other developing countries have so much in abundance and have little to show for it. Now, they made the best of what they have industry they promoted industry so much that there are many of the companies that are swiss companies and of course because they are a much smaller country the the market is much smaller those com companies eventually had had to like you know look outside to to market their product and to have other other uh, market outside switzerland and they did a great job with that and some of the biggest global brands in the world are Swiss companies, Swiss products like Nestle, for instance, and many others. In banking, they have, I mean, almost everybody in the world knows when you say Swiss bank, you know, banking in Swiss, that they have become 
the number one in terms of banking because of the reputation. There's what they call banking secrecy. That's one of the key things that has helped them to retain um, their position because they they don't divulge information about their clients, about their customers. So you see people from around the world, wealthy people especially, who go and put their money in the bank there and they are, um, and they are sure it's safe. Of course, politicians, corrupt politicians, especially in Africa, they exploited that too. Because in Nigeria, I remember many past leaders, military leaders, they did stash billions in Swiss bank account. Some of those monies um, we are repatriated recently. But you see, that was one of the things that gave them an edge. Their banking industry became uh, top notch that it became one of the biggest um, thing going on for the economy. Even though in recent time that has changed too, some of US policies in trying to crack down billionaires who try to evade tax and put um, stash their money abroad. So all of those and EU, they have adjusted in some of those, but it has also remained a key part of their economic growth and powerhouse. So that is to say, you may not have natural resources, you may not have oil, but there may be things you are good in, you can um, develop and be known for, and that could be what you can, you, you can use to drive your economy. That's a big thing to a lesson to learn from, from for other nations, because you may not have what other nations have, but what you have or what you are able to have or create, you can make the most of it, you can make the best of it. So, um, we are, I'm going to get into other aspects of it, but before then, I want to put, uh, we've put together a video or some videos, and I want us to, I want you to pay attention to watch it. It takes you through the history of, Sing uh, I was going to say Singapore, I've done Singapore before, the history of Switzerland, and, uh, and by the way, towards the end of this um, broadcast, I'm going to have some of the videos and pictures of my, my visit there a few years ago, um, you know, I, I put together some of those videos. Um, pictures but before then you know so the videos we've put together um you're going to be watching some of the history uh, the, the creation and some of the politics and i did a little tourism for i mean uh, they should be paying me for promoting tourism for them but i put together some video as well you know of um some of the best places to visit so if you ever want to pl or plan to visit singapore we have some tips on of some of the places to visit and I i'm so glad that i'm doing this today because it's one of those countries that i've always wanted to visit and by the grace of god it's one of those countries i've i've eventually visited i'm like you know what dreams do come do come true even though i hope to you know be there again i mean from time to time and someday like this program one of our goals is to get government officials um politicians leaders political leaders to get them to interview them on this program so we are going to be reaching out and interviewing some of the leaders um of the, these nations we cover very soon and by the way if you are watching this and you are a political leader of any nation in the world and you want us to focus on your country you want us to interview uh, maybe a president your governor a mayor and you want us to talk about your country your city your state maybe there is something you are doing in your in your state in your city in your nation and there have been positive changes from when you took over we reach out to us we want to do a story to to do to focus on your city your nation your um state and be able to let the world know what's going on and we are hoping that these brokers will do help inspire political leaders especially and other leaders to do the best they can to serve their people to serve their nation their state their city to serve humanity so that by the time you leave office you should be leaving it better than you found it you shouldn't be leaving it worse than you found it if you leave office worse than it was when you got there you are a failed leader and you are failed and that's why we have many failed leaders in africa and i'm hoping that these brokers will do help inspire and challenge most to become better leaders so um stay by uh, stay um stay stand by and watch some of these videos we've put together and i'm sure you are going to be inspired you are going to enjoy it and i'll be back um soon to talk about and discuss more about switzerland so you have been watching global politics today we are focusing on switzerland so let's go together to switzerland Launching Persistence Works Television Network, PWTN. Switzerland is known for its chocolate and neutrality. Wedged between Italy, France, Germany, and Austria, the humble, non-belligerent nation and base for the founding of the Red Cross has scarcely made a bad name for itself in the recent history books. 
When we think of Switzerland, we don't really think of violence or political turmoil. But that's because we also don't really think about how Switzerland became Switzerland. Today, the nation known by the name Switzerland in English is actually officially known as the Swiss Confederation. With four official languages and 41,285 square miles of land filled with roughly 8.6 million people, when you start to pay attention, you may start to wonder, how did this nation begin? Well, the formation of the Swiss Confederation seems to have happened in a few stages. Back in the BC era, modern-day Switzerland was occupied by Helvetic Celts and would later be taken under the crown of the Roman Empire. From there, the region passed between Germanic tribes Charlemagne and eventually the Holy Roman Empire. It was during this time that we see the first phase of the Swiss Confederation starting on the path that turned it into Switzerland as we know it. First came the Old Swiss Confederacy. In 1291, three Swiss cantons from within the Holy Roman Empire decided to form an alliance amongst each other in response to the destabilized environment around them. These cantons, Uri, Schwyz, and Unterwalden, agreed through a federal charter to jointly manage common interests, including defense and economy. While this wasn't the first time that such an agreement had been made, it is still marked by many historians and the Swiss state as the start of the modern nation's journey. This early confederacy would also grow fairly quickly, and by the 15th century, the three original members had welcomed in the city-states of Lucerne, Zurich, and Bern, in addition to the cantons of Glarus and Zug. This successful expansion was not praised by all, though, and the Austrians, in particular, became agitated by it. Military conflicts between members of the Swiss Confederacy and Austria began to break out off and on throughout the latter half of the 14th century. This clash was a result of the ongoing strife between the old Swiss Confederacy and the Duchy of Austria under the command of Leopold III and resulted in a remarkable Swiss triumph. Another victory came in 1388 when the Swiss and Austrians collided again, this time at the Battle of Naples. And an even bigger turning point came for the Swiss in 1499 with the Swabian War. The Swabian War occurred between the Habsburgs of Austria and their Swabian League allies against the Swiss Confederacy, with their friends from the Three Leagues of the Grison. As before, the root of the conflict was a territorial dispute over other neighboring lands, as the Swiss were continuing with their expansion at the expense of Austria's own ambitions. The war lasted from January through September of the same year and resulted in a peace treaty that greatly favored the Swiss and eventually granted the Confederacy de facto independence from the Holy Roman Empire. Still, the Swiss cantons remained an official part of the Holy Roman Empire for a bit longer. However, their expansion did not end by any means. For example, in 1501, two more cantons, Basel and Schaffhausen joined the Confederacy. In September of 1515, the Battle of Marignano between the old Swiss Confederacy pitted against France and Venice proved that the so far invincibility shown by the Swiss was not quite as bulletproof as they had hoped. Nonetheless, despite the crushing defeat, the Confederacy stood strong and moved on to the next obstacle the Protestant Reformation. The Swiss Confederacy was directly affected by the Reformation and subsequently became greatly divided. Between the influence from Luther over in Germany to that of Zwingli and Calvin, the Swiss were overwhelmed by Protestantism and many began to follow the movement and align with its beliefs. This caused a rift between those newly Protestant Swiss and the remaining Catholics within the Confederation and a period known as the Wars of Kappel and later the Wars of Vilmergen came as a consequence. Despite the internal conflicts, though, 
the overall shared interests of the Confederacy members proved to be of high importance and managed to hold the alliance together. As a result, by the mid-17th century, with the signing of the Treaty of Westphalia, the Swiss Confederacy was able to gain full independence from the Holy Roman Empire. Though freedom was sweet, it was short-lived for the Swiss. In the late 18th century, Napoleon led his troops into the Swiss cantons for a successful annexation that resulted in the establishment of a centralized government and a single state under the French. It took almost two decades for this to be undone with the Congress of Vienna in 1815, but this finally re-established the original confederacy. Additionally, this agreement reconfirms the former neutrality that the Swiss Confederacy had established back with the Treaty of Westphalia and allowed the admission of Valais, Neuchâtel, and Geneva into the Confederacy. This victory quickly led to another major step toward the establishment of today's Switzerland. After freeing itself from the grasp of France, the Swiss Confederacy faced a new string of internal conflict as the Catholics hoped to maintain the structures of old, while the Protestants wanted to create a more unified federal state instead, amongst other civil and religious disputes between the sides. Ultimately, the Protestants won the day, and it was decided that Switzerland would become a more unified federal state with a new official constitution in 1848. Later revisions were made to the Constitution in 1874 and once more in 1891, with some slight amendments also made in 1999. Thanks to this Constitution and its amendments, referendum democracy and autonomy for the included cantons became the new pillars of Switzerland's structure, and much of the Constitution was modeled after that of the United States. Some interesting inclusions in the new constitution were, for example, one clause that allows the entire constitution to be rewritten if that was found to be necessary. Another put an end to Swiss troops serving abroad outside of the Holy See and under Francis II of the Two Sicilies. Furthermore, the 1891 update put a strong emphasis on direct democracy and, for the most part, finalized its contents. During the 20th century, Switzerland continued to shape itself as a unified nation and a strong European political entity. Nonetheless, it opted to stay out of both world wars and eventually joined the Council of Europe in 1963 and became a full member of the United Nations in 2002. While attempts to join the European Union ultimately resulted in a culmination of failure and withdrawal of effort, Switzerland still maintains close ties with its surrounding EU neighbors and did vote to join the Schengen area. So today, the Swiss Confederation, or Switzerland, is a unified nation of roughly 64% Swiss-German speakers, 22% French speakers, 8% Italian speakers, and the remaining Romance speakers, with its constitution dating back to 1848, while many argue that the true date of the nation's origin can be traced all the way back to 1291. The question of how Switzerland came to be formed can be answered in a few ways. One being the simple timeline of how it happened. The formation of the old Swiss Confederation, the expansion period, freedom from the Holy Roman Empire, the centralization under Napoleon, the re-establishment of the original confederation with the Congress of Vienna, the Civil War, and finally, the establishment of the modern confederation and its constitution. This, of course, fails to address the rest of the how, or maybe the why. For a while, there was no desire for Switzerland to become any type of unified nation, and the rulers of the cantons were satisfied with the structure of the old confederacy. At that point in time, the higher priority was gaining more autonomy from the Holy Roman Empire and later France. Still, the first inklings of such changes may have begun with the 
churches may have begun with the Protestant Reformation back in the 16th century. Without a doubt, though, the division that this created proved to be a root cause and the eventual push by the Protestants for a unified state amongst other changes. The war between the traditional Catholics and the liberal Protestants only showed the people even more that unity was necessary and a federal government would be beneficial in healing the divide. Welcome to Pangaea. Today we're going to take a closer look at the Swiss political system. Switzerland is divided into 26 cantons. Each canton has an independent constitution, government, parliament, court and police and is again divided into several communities. Each community, each canton and the Swiss national government are therefore responsible for certain political fields. For example, the communities are responsible for kindergarten and primary school, the canton for grammar school and the Confederation of Switzerland for, for example, the ETH Zurich, the University of Technology in Switzerland. In this video we will mainly focus on the national political system because every canton works slightly different from the others. All four years the Swiss means a person over 18 with Swiss citizenship vote on the members of the National Council and the members of the Upper Chamber. In the National Council each canton gets assigned a number of seats in proportion to their residents. For example, the canton of Geneva with approximately 300,000 residents with Swiss passport gets assigned 11 seats, whereas the canton of Schaffhausen with approximately 60,000 residents with Swiss passport gets only assigned 2 seats. In the upper chamber, every canton has two seats, except for the canton of Obwalden, Nidwalden, Appenzell Außerrhoden, Appenzell Innerrhoden, Basel City and Basel District, which are so-called half cantons and therefore only have one seat in the upper chamber. After the election of the two chambers, the members of parliament vote on the federal council, the executive body of the Swiss national government which is divided into seven departments and therefore has seven seats to cover. Compared to other countries, this is quite special because instead of having one or two governing parties, right now in 2017 there are four governing parties in the Federal Council reaching from the Social Democrats to the right-wing Swiss People's Party. Switzerland has however a president which is a member of the Federal Council but because the president changes every year within the Federal Council and he has no additional power, the president of Switzerland is politically rather unimportant. With Switzerland becoming a federation in 1848, Switzerland was not only one of the first countries with democracy, the Swiss also implemented direct democracy and have stayed till today one of the few countries where people can vote on a regular base on laws and the constitution. On average, Swiss citizens can vote four times a year on certain issues within the community, the canton and the nation. However, we have to differentiate between three different types of votes. The obligatory referendum, the optional referendum and the petition for a referendum. An obligatory referendum has to take place when the two national chambers have agreed to change the constitution. And to put a new article into place, the Swiss citizen have to decide whether they support it or not. An example would be the Pension Plan 2020, which was accepted by the two chambers in January of 2017 and which will be voted on the 24th September of 2017. An optional referendum can take place after the two chambers have passed a new law. To bring the law to a vote, the Swiss have to collect 50,000 signatures within three months and after that an optional referendum can take place. An example is the energy bill which was accepted on the 21st May of 2017 by 58% of voters.
The third option is called the petition for a referendum and makes it possible for the Swiss to change the constitution without the parliament. To bring it to a vote, they have to collect 100,000 signatures within 18 months. An example would be the initiative for the unconditional basic income, which was rejected on June 5, 2016. Direct democracy is not always easy, especially because certain petitions for a referendum are incompatible with the existing constitution and have therefore caused big discussions within the country in the past. It is, however, a further development of democracy and the Swiss consider direct democracy very valuable. If there is a country that symbolizes economic success, it must be Switzerland. I mean, there is a reason why we call other countries Switzerland of the Middle East or Switzerland of South America. And that's because for centuries, it has been one of the wealthiest countries in the world. And it managed to remain at the very top until today, thanks to its unique economic model. But while most people still have noticed, the truth is that this model is facing more and more problems. The world has changed and what worked for Switzerland for so long is not working anymore. And for the first time in history, the future of the Switzerland's economic model is in serious trouble. But to understand why it's in trouble, we first need to explain what made Switzerland so wealthy in the first place. And while there is a popular idea that it was the Second World War and hiding Nazi gold, that is incorrect. Because while the story about Nazi gold is true, Switzerland was actually already rich way before that. The real story of the Swiss wealth begins in the mid-19th century. Before that, Switzerland as a state didn't really exist, and instead it was a loose confederacy of relatively poor mini regions constantly fighting with each other. But in 1848, Switzerland was established as a unified state, and soon after, it turned from a simple rural country to one of the most developed economies in the world because of two things. First, immediately after Switzerland became an actual country, it started building railways, connecting the different regions. Suddenly, many small companies spread around the country were able to grow at a much higher pace, and Switzerland went through a boom of industrialization in everything from pharmaceuticals, machinery, and luxury watches. And since Switzerland was still a small market, the new companies were forced to aggressively expand abroad, and over time they managed to grow into global giants, many of whom are still around today. And second, the Swiss banking industry was born, and pretty much since the start, it was an immediate hit, thanks to one thing that made the Swiss banks different from banks anywhere else, the practice of what's called banking secrets. Swiss banks committed to never disclosing any information about their clients, including who they are or what accounts they have, to any corporation, government or law enforcement agency. And once Switzerland finally became a unified country with its own currency, stable political system and the official policy of neutrality, it quickly became a very attractive place for many wealthy individuals to store their money. And over the coming decades, its popularity grew. Large Swiss banks like Credit Suisse and UBS were formed. Swiss bankers were going around Europe promoting banking secrecy. And while Europe was going through wars and instability, Switzerland remained a stable neutral country where a breach of the banking secrecy became a federal crime. As a natural result, Switzerland became the place for wealthy people from all over the world to store their money, and the Swiss banks made insane profits from providing that service, turning Switzerland into one of the richest countries in the world, with its banking system as the backbone of its economy. But this model that worked for so long is not really working anymore, and here's why. But first, I want to talk about a Number 7. Zurich. Switzerland's largest city, Zurich, will appeal to travelers with an interest in culture, since it boasts more than 50 museums and over 100 art galleries. When visitors get tired of shopping for internationally famous Swiss brand name goods, they can take a boat ride on Lake Zurich or go hiking in the nearby mountains. The city also boasts an impressive number of clubs for travelers who enjoy going out at night. Not to be missed is the Swiss National Museum, located in a fairy tale castle. It is dedicated to Switzerland's cultural history. 
but recently their problems have been growing bigger and bigger. It all started in the US, in the aftermath of the economic crisis of 2008. In the same year when the US economy was hit by a major financial crisis, Barack Obama won the presidential election. On, among others, the campaign claimed that everyone needs to pay their dues, and that the government needs to crack down on wealthy Americans that are avoiding paying their taxes. And he specifically named Switzerland and Swiss banks with their secret accounts as the culprits that make this tax evasion possible. Once he assumed office, Switzerland found itself under an ever-increasing pressure from the US government to breach its centuries-long tradition of banking secrecy and hand over the information about their American clients, something that was actually against the Swiss law. But even though Switzerland fought tooth and nail against it, there's only as much that you can do when the most powerful country in the world really wants something from you. And as it happens, tax revenue is a pretty important motivation for the US government. And when the US was joined by the European Union, Switzerland found out that there's not much it can do. And rather than facing gigantic fines and sanctions, Swiss banks backed down. And since 2008, they went from not giving any information to anyone to providing information about their clients from the EU and the US to their respective governments every year. So while formally the banking secrecy still applies, in reality, the practice no longer exists. And if you're an American or a European citizen, putting your money in a Swiss bank account is not any more secret than doing it in your own country. And that is naturally very bad news for Switzerland, since the centuries-long tradition, which made the Swiss banks so famous and so attractive, disappeared in less than a decade. And every year, the Swiss banks are forced to open up more and more. In order to save their clientele, and at least some of its appeal, the Swiss banks tried to change their value proposition. If they can't offer secrecy anymore, they doubled down on the offer of stability. You might no longer be able to hide your money from your own government in Switzerland, but at least you know that they are safe. After all, banks do fall every now and then, and the new marketing strategy for the country was to say that unlike in the US or the EU, the Swiss banks are a bastion of stability, safety, and security, where you can store your money without being afraid of what's going to happen with them. Except that's no longer really true either. In March this year, Credit Suisse, the second largest Swiss bank with 50,000 employees and more than 150 years of history, found itself on the edge of a total collapse. Contrary to the public image of Swiss banks as symbols of stability and careful management, Credit Suisse was everything but that. In recent years, the bank was bleeding money that it sank into bad investments, and it was battling a series of scandals, including involvement in money laundering, tax fraud, mismanagement of client funds, and bank executives that were spying on each other. As a result, by 2023, it was in a dire financial situation, and it was running out of money, but its biggest lenders refused to keep providing more cash, which sent the bank on the edge of bankruptcy. In the end, the Swiss government had to step in in the last minute and force the largest Swiss bank, UBS, to buy Credit Suisse as the only possible way to prevent a complete meltdown of the entire Swiss financial system. But while Switzerland managed to dodge this bullet, this episode showed what shape the country's banking system is really in. The Swiss banks turned out to be just as badly managed and irresponsible with their clients' money as banks everywhere else. Their second largest bank and the entire banking system along with it nearly collapsed, which would have sent Switzerland into a worse crisis than the one in 2008. And instead of having two large banks, Switzerland now has one megabank, which is not in a great shape either. And if the megabank would collapse, it would take down the entire country along with it, which kind of makes the entire Swiss banking system pretty vulnerable. And that's not the end of the problems that the Swiss banks are facing. For centuries, Switzerland managed to benefit from conflicts that raged around it, thanks to its famous principle of neutrality, basically not choosing sides and remaining on good terms with everyone. But even that is not really working out anymore. While Swiss banks were known to do business with anyone, regardless of the geopolitical situation, they are now under increasing pressure to confiscate and hand over hundreds of billions of dollars that Russian oligarchs have stored in Swiss banks, or face sanctions if they refuse to do that. And most likely, they will sooner or later give in, which will further diminish the reputation of what a Swiss bank account used to mean, and provide another reason why people might want to put their money somewhere else instead.
Now, does all this mean that the Swiss economy is facing an imminent collapse? Well, no. Apart from banking and finance, Switzerland still has many extremely successful companies that are not going anywhere. And the Swiss will probably continue to be a relatively wealthy country for a lot longer. But chances are, they will be not as wealthy as before. The banking sector is an extremely important part of the Swiss economy, and it has already been in a difficult spot after it lost its banking secrecy, which used to be a major competitive advantage. And now, after the embarrassing scandals and the fall of Credit Suisse, the stability of the Swiss banks is not guaranteed anymore either, meaning there are less and less reasons to put your money in a bank in Switzerland, while there are many other countries that offer a good amount of secrecy without all the annoying spotlight that Switzerland is now under. And so the reputation and fame of the Swiss banks, along with their massive profits, are more and more a thing of the past. Switzerland is a small country that sits smack dab in the middle of the Alps, making for 360 degree scenery wherever a person finds themselves. Numerous lakes also add to the picture postcard look of this country, whose most famous citizen may have been the fictional Heidi. From banks to bucolic alpine meadows, Switzerland has it all. Here's a look at the best places to visit in Switzerland. Number 10. Interlaken Interlaken used to be known as a watchmaking center, but today it's more popular as a tourist resort. Tourists started coming to Interlaken in the early 1800s to breathe in the mountain air and partake of spa treatments. Its popularity only grew from there, offering spectacular views of three famous Swiss mountains, the Eiger, the Jungfrau, and the Munch. The city is also a popular base camp for outdoor activities in the surrounding Bernese Oberland Alps. Hungry tourists may want to try raclette, a classic Swiss dish made from cheese. Number 9. Lausanne Athletes with Olympic aspirations may enjoy a visit to Lausanne, a scenic city that is the second largest on Lake Geneva as it is home to the International Olympic Committee. Lausanne also is the gateway to some of the world's best ski slopes. A part of the Swiss Riviera, Lausanne has been popular with writers over the centuries, including Lord Byron, the Shelleys, and Ernest Hemingway. Located in the French-speaking sector of Switzerland, Lausanne boasts an impressive cathedral and wonderful outdoor markets. Number 8. Geneva Geneva is a city where international influences reign supreme. It is home to the International Red Cross Committee and the European Headquarters of the United Nations, as well as 20 other international organizations. Environmental travelers will enjoy the fact that Geneva is a green city, with 20% of its land devoted to parks, earning it the nickname of City of Parks. Top sites include the Cathedral of St. Pierre, where John Calvin gave famous sermons, and the United Nations headquarters. Geneva also is a good city to explore by bike or rest weary feet by taking a boat ride on Lake Geneva.
Number seven, Zurich. Switzerland's largest city, Zurich, will appeal to travelers with an interest in culture, since it boasts more than 50 museums and over 100 art galleries. When visitors get tired of shopping for internationally famous Swiss brand name goods, they can take a boat ride on Lake Zurich or go hiking in the nearby mountains. The city also boasts an impressive number of clubs for travelers who enjoy going out at night. Not to be missed is the Swiss National Museum, located in a fairy tale castle. It is dedicated to Switzerland's cultural history. Number 6. Zermatt Zermatt is a small town that is famous for skiing and mountaineering due to its proximity to the Matterhorn, one of Switzerland's highest mountains. Cable cars whisk skiers up surrounding mountains in the winter and hikers in the summer. Zermatt is a good town for walking to various sites since gasoline-driven vehicles are not permitted. Any vehicles within the city limits must be battery-operated. Fortunately, for visitors, it takes 30 minutes or less to walk between sites. The town is accessible via scenic train routes that connect it with the outside world. Number 5. Jungfrau Region The Jungfrau Region is one of the most scenic places to visit in Switzerland, both in summer and winter. A century or two ago, this Alps region was only visited by hardcore adventurers who wanted to ski or climb through the mountains. Now, thanks to an extensive network of railways and well-maintained foot and bike paths, the area is accessible to many types of travelers. The Jungfrau region consists of four picturesque towns, Grindelwald, Muren, Lauterbrunnen, and Wengen, and three imposing mountains, Eiger, Munk, and Jungfrau. Number 4. Lugano Lugano has been nicknamed the Monte Carlo of Switzerland because of its growing popularity with celebrities. The city is located on Lake Lugano in the Italian-speaking section of this alpine country. Lugano, which is blessed with warm summers, dates back to the 9th century. The city is home to a large number of Swiss heritage sites, including three cathedrals and several museums. Home to numerous financial institutions, the city also hosts an annual classic music festival, the Lugano Festival in the summer. Number 3. Lake Geneva One of the largest lakes in Europe, Lake Geneva lies on the course of the Rhone River, on the frontier between France and Switzerland. Aside from the city Geneva, most destinations in the Lake Geneva region are in either the Swiss canton of Vaud or the French department of Haute-Savoie. The geography is varied, with the Jura Mountains in the north, a hilly plain in the center, and in the southwest, the Alps. The main attractions here are the elegant cities and towns surrounding the lake, the opportunities for skiing and hiking in both mountain ranges, and, of course, the lake itself.
Number 2. Lucerne Lucerne, located in the German-speaking section of Switzerland, is a city that has it all. City life, a lake, and mountains. Considered one of the world's prettiest cities, Lucerne is most famous for its 14th century chapel bridge and water tower, which is said to be the most photographed monument in Switzerland. Another famous monument is the Dying Lion, which was carved out of rock to honor Swiss mercenaries who died in France in 1792. Hungry visitors may want to try Luzerne Chugel Pastet, a local specialty made from puff pastry, veal, and mushrooms doused in cream sauce. Number 1. Bern Bern is a picturesque medieval city with a history that dates back to the 12th century, though it did not become a part of the Swiss Confederacy until the 16th century. Its most famous attraction is an ancient clock tower with moving puppets that once served as the western gate of the city. Other popular sites in Bern include the Münster, a Gothic cathedral that rises from the old town, and its town hall. The bear is the symbol of Bern, with several being kept in an open-air pit. Shoppers will appreciate the old town that boasts four miles of arcades, making it one of the longest covered shopping areas in Europe. Persistence Works Television Network, PWTN. Hey, welcome back, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that, um, those um, presentation. You are watching Global Politics. We are focusing on Switzerland, or we've, we've been focusing on Switzerland. And we just took some time to put together the videos that talked about Switzerland, their, their history, their politics, and some of the interesting places to visit. Um, because you can't really talk about Switzerland without talking about um, places to visit because it's a very beautiful, lovely city, um, nation. And as I said before, I visited Switzerland for missions, for ministry, and I also took time to visit a lot of interesting places like the last few videos, um, pictures you saw. And I did have a great time and it's a, a beautiful place. So um, the bottom line of it all is that it's one of those success stories uh, of a nation. And they did some things that has worked for them and the challenge now is for developing nations, especially um, especially in Africa, to learn a thing or two 
to um to to take a leave from some of the things they've done that has worked for them despite the fact that they don't have natural resources like oil because often people think oh if you don't have oil you are doomed a country like germany doesn't even have oil so you can see from everything you've we've um, presented that um, um switzerland doesn't have all the natural resources that many african countries especially nigeria are endowed with yet they've done so well for themselves so my biggest challenge to the um developing nations especially and their leaders their politicians is look at nations like these that have succeeded learn a thing or two uh, take a, a leave from some of what they've done that have made it a success and implement it in your own case of course you can customize and implement but at the end of the day everything rises and falls on leadership if a country or a nation succeeds is succeeding or it has succeeded because of the leadership if they have failed they have failed because of leadership so um the days of leaders kind of trying to shift the blame and say oh it's because of the person i took over from oh it's because of something that those days are over if your nation is failing and you are the leader you are the one failing because at the end of the day everything rises and falls on leadership so i hope today's um, broadcast has inspired you and challenged you and maybe some of you watching you may want to visit um switzerland one of these days and, and i want to thank you for watching up to this point let me remind you that these brokers come to you every wednesday um we stream we focus on different nations and different cities and different states as i said before if you are a politician a, a, a political leader I was going to say religious no political leader if you are a governor a president of a nation if you are a, a mayor and you want us to focus on your city on your nation on your state hey reach out to us we are going to uh, we'll love to um interview you government officials if if we need to come in person to your nation we are open to that for that as well but this program is focused on you know political leaders nations and all the that is happening and sometimes we cover some not too good stories but i love to cover the success stories more of um, most of the time but i want to thank you so much for joining so let me remind you to join me every wednesday on global politics next wednesday we're going to focus on something else or, or some other nation or city until then well let me also remind you to join me every day monday to friday I do have our um, persistent works online prayer every day on same station, same time. Well, the time is 10 a.m. Mountain Time, 12 noon New York Time, 5 p.m. London Time, GMT Time, and 6 p.m. Nigerian Time. So join me every day. Every Tuesday, I do have my, I talk about my books, persistent works book series. And um, join me um, every Tuesday around the same time that we did this broadcast too, which is 2 p.m. Uh, mountain time 4 p.m new york time that will be 9 p.m gmt and 10 p.m um 10 p.m nigerian or west african time so join me also every wednesday on this broadcast as i've said and on thursdays i do bring guests into the studio to talk with them and interview them in our special program our unique program persistence works moment so i want to invite you to join me every thursday as we interview different men of god business leaders and people who have been you know have done great um, for themselves and we learn secret of success and learn how they've succeeded and where they failed so that we can avoid those pitfalls and then on fridays we celebrate birthdays i love to celebrate birthdays so if your birthday is coming up hey reach out to us we want to help you celebrate your birthday so it's your birthday on persistent works tv network so we we said we do that every friday we have different packages you know so you you will enjoy you know the package we put together we'll get some american celebrities to sing happy birthday to sing and wish you happy birthday if you want to watch some of the past editions we've we've done just go to our tv um, channel if you're on roku on on fire tv on apple tv on our app our android app iphone app just go to the video on demand session and go, you'll see the birthday it's your birthday um, um segment watch any of those you will be inspired and you will want your birthday to be here so if your birthday is coming up soon reach out to us let's help you celebrate it and make it a bang praise god and then i want to remind you once again our magazine persistence works magazine we do publish it uh, now it's been published by monthly so the current edition is is really very powerful very interesting so i want to you can read it from our app you know you can also go to from any of our website you can go to persistent works mark persistence works mark.com to read it uh, to read 
each of your editions. The next upcoming edition is going to be even more powerful. So I want to thank you for your time. So remember that we bring you, we come your way every day with inspirational content to challenge, to inspire you. If you have not followed me on social media, do follow me across the board. My goal is to have 1 million followers across the board. So we are on all the leading social media platforms, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Twitter is now X, um, um, TikTok, everywhere. So help, um, follow us and we'll bring uh, many of our live programs stream in all of those platforms as well. Praise God. Well, once again, I want to thank you for your time and thank you for spending time to be with me this um, on this day. I hope you did enjoy, you've enjoyed this broadcast today, Global Politics Focus on Switzerland. So until I come your way again, um, by the way, don't go away because I have some announcement coming to you shortly after this. But until I come your way again, you've been watching Global Politics Focus on Switzerland and I've been your host as always, Bishop Connor Paul Vincent. And I want to remind you, remember, Resistance works. God bless you. We hope you've been blessed by today's TV broadcast. Join us again for our next TV broadcast. If you have a testimony of how you've been blessed, please let us know. Send us an email at PersistenceWorksTV at Yahoo.com. Please support our TV network with your donation to help us reach the nations with the gospel. You can give through PayPal, Zelle, Cash App, or online at www.persistenceworks.tv. You can make your checks payable to Vincent Paul Ministries International at 11829 Glen Evans Lane, El Paso, Texas 79936 USA. Attention, pastors and bishops, if you want to air your church or ministry program on Persistence Works TV Network, or you want to promote your product or services, contact us today. Send us an email at PersistenceWorksTV at Yahoo.com. Download our Persistence Works TV Network app in the App Store or Google Play Store. Also, add us and watch us on Roku, Fire TV, and Apple TV. Read our Persistence Works magazine and enjoy great content. Simply visit the settings page of our Persistence Works TV network app, click on the button to read the electronic edition of the magazine. To order the print ebook or audiobook editions of our Persistence Works book series, visit the settings page of our Persistence Works TV network app. Follow Bishop Colonel Paul Vincent across his social media platforms, Facebook, X, TikTok, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Truth Social. For more information about PWTN, visit www.persistenceworks.tv. Do you need inspiration and motivation to reach your dreams in life? Are you trying to overcome discouragement? Do you desire a deeper spiritual walk with God? Do you question your destiny? Then the Persistence Works book series by the prolific author and international speaker, Dr. Vincent N. Paul, is written for you and is now available in paperback, audiobook, and ebook. Order today by calling 866 909 2665 or go online, persistenceworks.com. If you need that salvation, if you need that forgiveness, you can receive it tonight. Shout hallelujah! The anointing breaks the yoke. Hear Dr. Paul N. Vincent preach the anointed word of God that changes lives and brings salvation, healing, and deliverance. Invite him to minister in your church, conference, or crusade. Also read his life-changing books in the Persistent Work series. For more information about inviting Dr. Vincent to minister or to order his books, visit vincentpaulministriesinternational.com. Dr. Paul N. Vincent, internationally known author and preacher, invites you to his annual Persistence Works Holy Land Tour in October and April. These memorable trips throughout Israel and include visiting historical sites in Jerusalem, Nazareth, and Bethlehem, as well as the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, and many more. Your travel package includes round-trip airfare from Houston, Texas, and Lagos, Nigeria to Tel Aviv, first-class hotels, two meals a day, air-conditioned buses, and Israeli Ministry of Tourism-approved English-speaking guides. For more and to register, visit vincentpaultours.com today. For more information about PWTN, visit www.persistenceworks.tv.